And not only that, they had to send people out into the highways and byways to beg the women to come in and hear me th <laughs> this hour. And in this blue box here that I've asked other speakers concerning, and they say it's connected to an explosive device, <laughs> and so you will quit on time one way or the other. It's a joy for me to be here and uh, to hear these wonderful things that Maxie said about me. It makes me feel real good. He has such a kind way about himself and uh, of, uh, a way of making us feel good. Mark Twain said, I can live a whole month on one good compliment. And I feel that way today as well. It reminds me of an occasion. There's no extra charge for this that I'm going to throw in. But I was in my study many years ago in a uh, congregation where I was preaching. And a, a preacher friend came in to visit. And we had a nice visit for a an hour or so, and he got up to leave. And as he was getting up to leave, he turned to me and looked me square in the face, and he said, Guy, how long has it been since you were affirmed? And I had no idea what he was talking about. But I didn't want to appear foolish or without understanding, and so I just shrugged my shoulders, and I said, Well, you know how it is. Uh, I'm, it's been a while, I guess. And so I did appear foolish. It looked uh, like I didn't have any understanding. And he, he grabbed a chair. I remember it so vividly. And he brought that chair over behind my desk. And he sat it beside my chair. And he said, sit down, guy. I'm going to affirm you. And I'm thinking, is this going to hurt? <laughs> and he began to talk about me. And he said, let me tell you what I hear other people saying about you. And he said a lot of nice, wonderful things that I didn't know people were even thinking about me. And he said, let me tell you what I think about you. And he began to tell me what great abilities I had and the potential I had and what uh, he saw in me and my strengths and my, uh, you know, potential. He went on for over 10 minutes. Who was I to interrupt this guy? He was on a roll. <laughs> I tell you, when he left, I was walking on air. Made you feel so good. You're thinking, what does this have to do with this man's topic from Ecclesiastes? Well, really, it has everything to do with it. Because here was a brother who was living positively, and he helped me to live positively. If you know how good it makes you feel to affirm or to be affirmed by people, then maybe we'll pass that on to other folks and help them to live a good and positive life. I thank Brother Bourne for inviting me to be here and for the nice things that he said about me. I'll live another month on, on all of that. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes. In your Bibles, it's on page 583 if you're having a little trouble finding it. <coughs> Ecclesiastes is sometimes a ne neglected book. It presents a rather en en enigma to us. It's rather puzzling about some things. One of the first things we notice is this word, Ecclesiastes. It's an English transliteration of a Greek translation of the Hebrew word koheleth. Now, if that isn't confusing enough for you, let me add to that. We don't really know for certain what that word koheleth means. We think it means something along the line, and scholars are in agreement with this, that it means something like speaker of the assembly. And so on the seven occasions that you'll find the Hebrew term in the text of Ecclesiastes, it's usually translated by the word speaker or preacher, as the American Standard uses it. The first verse says this, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now there's another puzzlement. Who is this son of David, king in Jerusalem? And there's a lot of debate among scholars as to the identity of the author of Ecclesiastes. Traditionally, we have understood this to be Solomon. And yet, uh, scholars debate that because the expression, son of David, can actually mean one of the descendants of David. And there have been a number of these, of course, all of these have been uh, kings in Jerusalem that were sons of David. 
But everything seems to fit Solomon as being the author. And that's the traditional view, and I accept that. But listen to how he begins this treatise. In verse 2, he says, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, if you were wanting to write a bestseller, that's probably not a good opening line, is it? It's kind of discouraging when you think about it. It reminds me of old Grandpa Jones on Hee Haw singing, Gloom, Despair, and Agony on Me. It just doesn't invite you to and encourage you toward a great and glorious kind of life, does it? It seems to be focusing on all of the negatives of life, and people tend to understand this great book in negative terms. But listen to what he says here in uh, chapters 1, verse 12, through 2, and verse 17. Because in these verses, he is actually telling us of his quest for the meaning of life. And he engages in what I would call the five W's of the world, or the five worldly W's. Wine, women, wealth, work, and wisdom. And all of that is outlined for us in these verses, chapter 12, one, chapter 1, verse 12, through chapter 2, in verse 17. And it doesn't matter whichever road he might take in those directions, he always comes up empty in seeking satisfaction with life. And so in verse 17 of chapter 2, you can turn to that verse and listen, as Solomon comes to this conclusion. He says, So I hated life. Because the work that is wrought under the sun was grievous unto me, for all is vanity and a striving after wind. All is vanity and a striving after wind. Now you may take that incorrectly. And I think a lot of people tend to move in negative responses to what Solomon says here. But I would remind you that he's talking here about life as it is lived under the sun. And that expression, life under the sun, is repeated 29 times throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. And it seems to refer to life only as it is lived and considered in the here and now, life on earth. And in many passages, it's life as it is considered without God being brought into the picture. And so life under the sun only leads us into vanity and a striving after wind. Now, I hope this morning to present to you a, a kind of view of Ecclesiastes that will lead you to understand some positive aspects of this great book. Most people, after reading Ecclesiastes, consider him to be rather pessimistic. In fact, a lot of people just, well, they want to take a pill and lie down after they read this book. It's so negative and depressing. It's like watching the evening news that realistically and sometimes unrealistically presents life in its worst forms to us. But I think that Solomon has a very positive view of life. First, there's this mention of God 41 different times in the book. And so he acknowledges not only the existence of God, but he encourages all of his readers to uh, fear God. And so whenever you bring God into the picture, that gives us cause to find reason for living and purpose in life and can lead us to a positive kind of response to life. But secondly, there are seven strong statements made throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, and I've included these in the material in the lectureship book for you. Seven statements that teach us and exhort us to enjoy the life that God has given us. These are sometimes called the eat, drink, and be merry uh, passages, but he is not telling us to, to live a hedonistic kind of lifestyle. He does not mean eat, drink, and be merry in the sense in which most moderns use that phrase. On every occasion, Solomon indicates that this is to be done with the realization that God brings everything into judgment. And so he is advocating a joyful and a positive approach to life in godly ways. A third reason why I think we should take the book of Ecclesiastes as a positive statement of concerning life is simply because he is being realistic in his approach and in his quest for the meaning of life. 
He's simply being honest about the circumstances of our human existence, and so we should not interpret that as some kind of pessimistic hopelessness. It is life under the sun, that Solomon says, is nothing but vanity and a striving after wind. And so let me begin with laying out six principles of the positive life that we find in this great text. And I think that if you read carefully, you will find that Solomon has discovered a number of principles that determine the direction that we take in life, whether it's negative or positive. And I believe that these axioms are indisputable. They are what you find when you're examining this life that we have under the sun. And they will indeed determine whether or not you will enjoy your life, whether or not you'll move your life in godly ways, or whether you will move them in more negative and miserable ways. Principle number one is this. Life is a gift from God. There was a time in our country when everyone understood that, or the majority of the people understood that, and we lived our lives recognizing that they are indeed a gift from God. That's no longer true today. Quoheleth, or Solomon, declares that there's nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and make his soul good or enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, he says, that it is from the hand of God. And he refers to life as being a gift from God in chapter 3 and verse 13 and also in chapter 5 and verse 15. He speaks of all of the days of our life have been given to us by the Creator. He acknowledges that we are creatures, that we are given a special gift. And when you think about it, folks, and, and sometimes you ought to slow down in your living and just recognize what a wonderful gift that we've been given to have being, to exist, to see the days of the sun, and to enjoy the possibility of existence in life. And we are in control of that, and that moves us in certain directions in our life. That's principle number one that's unalterable. Principle number two is this, that life is filled with many unalterable circumstances. There are some things about our existence, folks, that you can not change. No matter how hard you try and no matter how frustrated you might become, you simply cannot change them. One of those things today is a man on a couch during football season. Folks, there are just some unalterable consequences of life. And ladies, it doesn't matter how much conjoling you might render that man. He's not budging from August until January. Those are unalterable circumstances of life. We can let these things frustrate us and move us in a direction away from enjoying life. The preacher says this in chapter 1 in verse 15. He says, that which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. There are just some things you cannot change. In chapter 1, he says, one generation goes and another generation comes. And when you look at his conclusion to all of those things, he's saying there are life cycles that occur that cannot be altered. You can live on this earth for many years, and really the earth does not change for you having been here. I live in the beautiful city of Durango, Colorado, and I marvel at the mountains that surround that city. They are beautiful peaks, and they're solid rock, some of them. Those mountains were there a thousand years or thousands of years before I arrived. They'll be there after I leave. They will not change. There are circumstances in our lives that face us that we cannot change. And we may get frustrated and they may try to depress us, but Solomon advises that we recognize the reality of that and move on with our life and not let that get us down. Principle number three is this. Life can be unfair. 
I remember Bill Gates saying that to a college graduation class that he addressed a few years ago. You just got to get over the fact that life is going to be unfair. There are going to be injustices in life that you'll never change. For example, why is it that the Dallas Cowboys are not in the playoffs and the Washington Redskins are? That's not right. What's up with that? Well, it's unfair. But folks, that's the way life is. And so Solomon lists a number of things that he observed in his quest for the meaning of life that is really just unfair. People are oppressed without comfort, he says in chapter 4. That's not right. There are occasions where justice is denied, chapter 5 and verse 8. The righteous can die young while the wicked can actually prolong their lives for years, chapter 7 and verse 15. It's not fair. A poor man can deliver a city out of its trouble and never be honored for all of the effort that he put forth, chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. And there's a clear statement of this principle, I think, in chapter 8 and verse 14, where he says, There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there are righteous men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked, and again there are wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. So Solomon recognizes this principle of life, that life can be unjust, it can be unfair. And he recommends, however, that we not allow this to rob us of joy. Principle number four is this. Life is unpredictable. Things happen that you could never foresee. Who could ever have predicted the events of 9-11? Or that we would be in a second war with Iraq? If you had told me five years ago that a hurricane might actually wipe out an entire city the size of New Orleans, I probably would have doubted that. Who would ever predicted that? Things come down the pike that we hardly ever could have foreseen. And so Solomon says, you can dig a pit and fall into it. You can br uh, break through a wall and a serpent could bite you in chapter 10 and verse 8. There are many unpredictable things that can happen in your life. He says in chapter 9 and verse 11 that the race is not always to the swift. You would predict that USC would win the national championship, but Texas came through, didn't they? Who would ever have thought that? And he says that not only that, the battle is not always to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding. I was listening to an interview of several of our professional athletes the other day, and uh, one of these men could not hardly articulate a sentence. He was not a man of understanding, and yet he was worth millions and millions of dollars. Riches come unpredictably to men not of understanding. And so Solomon says time and chance happens to all of us. The great equalizer is time and chance. And so what comes down the pike cannot be predicted. We cannot know the future. But there's some good things that can come down the pike as well. And so I get excited about not knowing the future. We have two families in Durango who recently, within the past two years, have had uh, babies born into their family. And on both occasions, these families refused to allow the doctor to tell them the gender of the child before it was born. And that's because they enjoyed the excitement of not knowing and uh, the excitement of seeing for the first time. I think there can be great excitement in life by not knowing the future. And good as well as evil can come. Number five principle is simply this. Life is temporary and brief. On a number of occasions, Solomon uses the expression, the days of one's life. And so he narrows our lifespan into a matter of days and measures it by a small measurement of time. And really, our lives only consist of a few brief days on this earth. The New American Standard, which is normally the, the version that I use, and I use that because it's the one Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. It's a good version. You ought to try it sometime. 
The New American Standard uses the word fleeting on several occasions, especially in chapter 9 and verse 9 and chapter 11 and verse 10. Our life is fleeting. It's running away from us. It's hurrying away from us. He refers there to our time of existence on earth. And so Solomon advises the young people to use the days of their youth wisely. Chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. And I believe that once you realize how brief life really is, that it will cause you to want to live your life to the fullest. And I think that's what Solomon is after. There's a trite expression overused. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. I like that expression. It speaks to me. It has a powerful impact into my life. I know that today I begin the decline of the rest of my life. So that today becomes very important to me. Every moment is important to me. And that should cause me to want to live every day and every moment of this day to its fullest. Principle number six is this. Life is moving toward a destiny. We don't have a theology of heaven and hell in the book of Ecclesiastes. There's no real discussion about reward and punishment, but Solomon over and over again reminds us that we're moving toward an end. He speaks of death quite often in the text, and that death brings us to Sheol, chapter 9 and verse 10. And I think in that passage, Sheol has to re, uh, refer to the grave. That's where we go. Once we leave this realm, we are placed in the grave. But he says in chapter 12 and verse 7, the spirit of man returns to God who gave it. So he concludes this entire treatise by reminding us that we ultimately face the judgment of God in chapter 12 and verse 14. His advice, though, is to enjoy the life that God has given us, to enjoy it now in the time that we have before we reach our destiny. And so in chapter 3, in verse 22, he advises, Wherefore I saw there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his works, for that is his portion, for who shall bring him back to see what shall be after him? So enjoy the life that God has placed in your hands, of course, always recognizing that judgment is ultimately coming. Those are the principles that should govern our life. Life is a gift from God, number one. Life circumstances are often unalterable. Life can be unfair. Life is unpredictable. Many circumstances occur that you could never foresee. Life is temporary and brief, and life is moving toward a destiny. Now, growing out of those realizations, those first truths about life, come a number of rules and regulations that the preacher recommends that we follow toward good conduct and towards the positive life. A rule is nothing more than a do and don't concerning our behavior. And so if you do these things, Solomon suggests, then you're going to have a successful and happy life. If you ignore these rules, if you uh, tend to deny them, and these principles that I've laid out for you, then your life may well be miserable. So here's the first rule that I see Solomon giving us. It's found in chapter 11 and verse 7. Listen to the words from the American Standard Version. He says, Truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. When you get to this point... To chapter 11 in reading uh, Ecclesiastes, you may have gotten a little depressed by everything that he said. Some people might respond, well, wouldn't it have been better had I not even been born if life is as bad as, as he characterizes some things about life? So what Solomon is saying here is, no, it is good for the eyes to behold the sun. So rule number one is this, 
in spite of all of the problems that we are confronted with in life, say to yourself, it's great to be alive. That's Solomon's point here. It's great to be alive. Solomon was the very first Dale Carnegie. I remember Dale Carnegie saying and suggesting to people that you ought to get out of bed in the morning and roar like a lion. First time I did that, I had to peel my wife from the ceiling <laughs> and to calm all the children down for the day. He said, get out of bed and roar like a lion and then say out loud, today is going to be a great day. He said, if you'll do that, it will be a great day. Because it changes your attitude. It changes your perspective. And you're going to go through that day looking for the good things and the positive things of life. And so Solomon says, it's great to be able to see the sun, to have days in our life. That may sound like a positive mental attitude, but I think he's actually uh, giving us the realization of what we have in life itself. And folks, if we will change our perspectives of life, it will change the quality of our life. You know, some people have this uncanny ability to see all that is bad in our existence. And they're not able to really enjoy life or help others to enjoy life. Several years ago, I was talking with a deacon in a congregation, I think where I'd held a gospel meeting. And he and I were having a good time. We were laughing and enjoying life, and others had joined us in the discussion, and everything was jovial and pleasant. And he looked over to the side and saw a woman walking toward us, a rather large woman. And he said, as he shook his head this way, he said, Uh-oh, here comes old gloom and despair. Now, he could say that because this woman happened to be his sister in the flesh. He knew her. And he was right. As soon as she showed up, the whole atmosphere changed. A cloud formed over that group. It was dark. I thought it was going to rain any moment after she came into the group. People began leaving the group. I wasn't as rude as most of them. This brother bailed on me and left me there alone with his sister who told me every ache and pain she had since birth, I think. Some people can see nothing but bad in life. I don't care about your aches and pains. I got my own. I tell you, there's some people sitting here today who have been through a lot worse things than you'll ever go through, and you won't hear them complaining. Brother Dick Case is one of those men. They removed his sternum, he told me. They took muscles from his body where God put them and put them in different places just to hold his chest together. He's in pain. But you'll never hear it from him. We all have pain. We all don't like the weather sometimes. We all pay taxes. We all have to deal with this blue box up here. <laughs> but I'm not going to complain. <laughs> we have a brother several years ago in Durango who was a literal hypochondriac. I had never met one before. I hoped never to meet another one. You could not have a conversation with Bob uh, without him telling you what's wrong with him. And everything was wrong with him. You never went up and said, how you doing, Bob? Because he'd tell you. <laughs> and I began to notice after just two weeks, after this brother had placed membership with us, that people were avoiding him like the plague. I am not kidding you. And I'm not that rude. So I stood behind one of the biggest guys in our congregation so he couldn't see me when he would walk in. I wouldn't, you know, just bail out on the guy. You avoid people like that because they make life miserable for you. Solomon says it's good to see the sun. You ought to say it's great to be alive and enjoy every day of your life. 
And Solomon advocates that we ought to take a positive view about our work. And so many people think work is such a drudgery, doesn't it? don't we? But here's what Solomon says. He says, there's nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and make his soul enjoy good in his labor. Make his soul, make his soul enjoy good in his labor. You can do that. That's a choice. You can make yourself enjoy every aspect of life. Well, rule number two is this. Don't ignore the problems that we confront in life, but never allow those to become a hindrance to your enjoyment of living. I think we have to be realistic about the difficulties that confront us in life. We can't ignore those. We can't bury our heads in the sand. And so Koheleth says this in chapter 11 and verse 8. He says, Yea, if a man live many years... Let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. To remember means to bring it to your mind. You don't leave it, you bring it to your mind. You don't neglect it, you reflect on it. There are days of darkness. But did you hear what he says? Many years of life, days of darkness. He's comparing them. And by comparison, the days of darkness are relatively few. And so even though we have problems in life, let us not allow those to hinder us. Let's don't ignore them. And I think Solomon would advise us not to procrastinate in dealing with the issues we confront in life and the days of darkness. Because procrastination tends to make problems grow even larger, don't they? If you don't take care of the issues as they come, then they get even worse, don't they? In fact, in chapter 10, in verse 18, he says, by slothfulness, the roof sinketh in, and through idleness of the hands, the house leaketh. If you don't take care of those little annoying details, the problems that, that confront us day to day, they grow into bigger and even worse problems. But people can become very frustrated with life in general based upon the fact that they just have these problems. Well, the preacher suggests that we ought to keep busy as an antidote to all the problems of life. So he says, whatsoever you find your hand to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in shield where thou goest. Chapter 9 and verse 10. Activity, staying busy, changes the attitude and the disposition. When I have people come in to me and, and they're seeking help and they're despairing and, and disconcerted about something and depressed, I always advise them to get busy doing something and especially to get busy serving other people. That'll get you out of the doldrums. Have you ever thrown a pity party? You know what I'm talking about? You don't have to send out many invitations to that party. Nobody's coming but you. And you just wallow in self-pity. Well, get busy. Serve someone. And you will come out of that doldrum and the, the, the darkness of your life. Well, rule number three. Continue to pursue your youthful dreams. Continue to to pursue your youthful dreams. In chapter 11, listen to verses 9 and 10. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thy heart and in the sight of thine eyes. And know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment, Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Now, Solomon is saying that we ought to follow the impulses of our hearts and the desires of our eyes, especially when we're young, when we have our life before us and we have all of these youthful dreams. Don't ever let go of those things, but pursue those youthful dreams. 
There are two disclaimers that he gives here. In verse 9, he says that we need to recognize that all of these things will brought, be brought one day into judgment. And so we need to have godly dreams, don't we? And we need to set realistic goals for ourselves in keeping with the instructions of our God. Another disclaimer is to remove sorrow from you. The New American Standard says to remove vexation from you, which is, I think, a little closer translation of the Hebrew concept here. Vexation is really all of those little annoying things in life. And what Solomon is saying is don't allow those annoying things to hinder you from truly moving forward to reaching your goals in life and to enjoying life. We all have the little annoyances, don't we? Mine is my computer. I know that you have no problem with yours, but I do. I got a new computer a year or two ago and did not realize it, but the thing has a voice and a mind of its own. I named this thing Solomon at first. But when a mistake is made, there's a text box that comes up and it fills the screen and it tells you the error. And if you don't acknowledge that error in some way, the silly thing begins to talk to you in a feminine voice. <laughs> and it says this, it's not my fault. First time I heard that, I looked for my wife. It's this computer. It's not my fault, it says to me. And then it begins to read the silly text box that's there as if I can't read it myself. So Solomon says, throw these vexations away from you. I didn't, I, I changed the name from Solomon to Jezebel for this computer. <laughs> and I wanted to throw this thing out the window and let the dogs have it. You got to deal with all of that stuff and not let that get you down. Because every day there will be some little annoying thing. I've got to move on, the clock tells me. Number four, pursue those things which make for a well-ordered life. And I've listed a number of those for you in the, the lectureship book. Things like submit to authority, Solomon says. Find time for rest. Dress for success. That's what Solomon says. He says that let your garments always be white, keep them clean, and let not thy head lack oil. Dress for success. Seek companionship. Be true to your spouse. Establish a good reputation. Don't try to live in the past. Live in the present. All of those lead us to the well-ordered life. Rule number five at the end of the book is simply this. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's a rule. Fear God and keep his commandments. And this last rule is really rule number one, isn't it? If you bring God into your life and you reverence him and seek to do his will, you are going to be a happy and positive person. Have a great day. Thank you.